So this video covers our July 2021 performance figures for our solar PV Tesla Powerwall 2 performance here in the UK, along with our Tesla Model 3 and Hyundai Kona electric usage, plus other things that have happened during the month of July. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, John here and welcome. I'd like to give you a bit of an update of a couple of things that have happened during the month of July before we kick off and get into the figures. Like most people who have a Kefir MA120 electric smart meter, it has not been sending through the half hourly readings to the DCC. Ours was dead in the water from the 19th of May onwards, and it's an industry-wide issue apparently that Cafe have been working on with a resolution to roll out new firmware to fix the problem. Ours actually kicked in again, I guess when Octopus Stroke Cafe pushed out a test update, as our meter has actually recovered all of the data from when it stopped and <laughs> is then stopped again on the 6th of July. The new firmware has been tested and it's due to be sent out over the air over the air update nationwide in sort of mid-August. However, these times lines might slip due to governance and signing off procedures, so we'll wait and see. We also had our second quarter FIT payment arrive. It actually arrived on the 1st of June, but I forgot to mention it in our June update. The payment was £762.14 bringing the year-to-date total for the two quarters to £1,017. And these payments go towards home improvements, for example, our new front door. There's a link to that video up there if you haven't seen that. OK, um, not that much happened actually in July, so let's crack on with the monthly stats, shall we? I'll bring up a graphic on screen which you can pause the video and review if you want to. If you're not familiar with our setup and configuration, then also have a look down in the description. There's a list of all our components and our system setup, etc. etc. First chart then, this is our solar PV generation numbers. So for July 2021, our south southwest facing 6.34 arrays produced a total of 820 kilowatt hours for the two separate arrays. We had an average daily solar generation of 26.5 for the month and very pleased to beat May and June's total, which is unusual to do actually, because normally it's the other way around. July starts to tail off as we uh, get into the uh, shorter days. So yeah, that's my um, generation totals. So as always, I ask you to drop your generation totals and size of your system in the comments down below and your location if you fancy doing that. It does provide a really great comparison for other people who read all the comments and provides and, and proves very popular with, with people. And as I've always said, I like to see it and comment on it too. So thank you for those that take the time to do that. It's very much appreciated. If we look at our both arrays individually, our four kilowatt array produced 513 kilowatt hours. I'll assume kilowatt hours from now on. I'm not gonna say it each time because it gets a bit tedious and our newer 2.34 array produced 307. In terms of the power wall and solar working together for our self power, let's have a look at that. And um, we fared fairly well actually for self power during the month. I did find that I was swapping again between cost saving mode and self power mode. If the weather looked a bit um, iffy or unsettled or the forecast wasn't great, I would move to cost saving mode to pull from the grid as needed to get us through the 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. peak period uh, on battery power and sometimes on sun, depending on how sunny it was. And with the high price of the agile tariff, you know, it's a thing that you have to do. If the weather is okay um, or you know better, um, then we'll be in self-powered mode. And it was only six days during the month where we were in cost-saving mode during part of the day generally, and the remainder of the month we were in self-powered mode. And this is much better than how we fared in June when we were in cost-saving mode for 10 days during the month. The Octopus Agile rates have been really high for a few months now, and more and more of the 30-minute time slots are having high rates. 
And the downside is if you have to pull from the grid because there's insufficient solar, then the price is higher um, and obviously which adds to your electricity bill. As we head towards autumn, winter, I'll be keeping my eye on the rates and the amount that we're starting to pull from the grid. And it may even move, mean moving away from the Agile tariff and moving on to the GO tariff. That said, um, we are going to be hit by rising gas and electricity prices over the coming year as we head into winter. You know, that's been in the news. Um, and this is really due to a large ramp up in the wholesale prices of gas. We were self-powered from the Powerwall and solar contributions for 92% of the time. As you can see in the stack chart, 59% of that came from solar generation and 33% came from the Powerwall contribution. This chart compares the months of July from 2012 through to 2021. Values from 2020 onwards are for both arrays, whereas before they are just for the single four kilowatt array. Our original array produced 513 for the month, which means light for light performance is in the middle of the pack if we look back at the previous months in for July. However, as you can see there, the combined arrays did outperform our 2020 total. The Powerwall in and out chart, the Powerwall certainly seems to be maintaining its 88% round trip efficiency, so it's four months in a row it's been sitting at that figure. As you can see we stored 299 and it was able to supply 264. The additional sunshine really helped there, it meant it worked harder to store more solar and supply more to the house, um, hence the 92% self-powered. This chart gives you a little more detail on what happened day by day. Solar generation shown in yellow is strong throughout the month really. The peak generation was on the 17th of July at 40.8. We had 11 days where we generated above 30 um, in a single day. Our lowest recorded solar day was on the 25th of July at 6.6. House usage is shown in blue. This covers car charging, electric glass kilns and all other house um, items. And if you look at the solar generation, on 17 days it, during the month it outstripped uh, house usage. Which is good to see. <laughs> oh yeah, grid pull. Grid pull is shown in red. The spikes you will see is where we ran the glass kilns overnight in the early hours. Uh, this was done because the forecast of the following day was poor solar production, which meant we'd be unable to run the glass kiln during the day purely from solar generation and battery power. We ran the kiln 17 times over the course of the month. And considering that there were just seven peaks of grid pull, it meant that 10 kiln filings were done on 100% solar power stroke um, battery. And that works out about 70 kilowatts that we'd save there, which is good news. 70 kilowatt hours. We didn't export too much back to the grid, as shown in orange. Our largest single export was 12 kilowatt hours on the 5th of July. This was a day I paid a visit to Nigel, an EV puzzle, and obviously I had the car. And then Julie, my wife, was out in the Kona, so there was nothing at home to soak up the excess power. Have a look at the totals quickly. Um, so these charts just show the totals for the four data sources that we've just looked at in the day by day. The house usage in blue is the, perhaps the key one to have a look at at 838.5 versus our solar total of 820. Interestingly enough, if I compare the solar generation totals to what the Tesla app is showing for the month, there's quite a variance. I take the solar totals from the generation meters my, my sort of daily ritual is to record the end of day solar total for both arrays and then drop them into my spreadsheet. And that's strictly from the generation meters. And that's something I've always done. That means that the spreadsheet solar total I know is accurate. All of the other totals are taken from the Tesla app, so grid pull, grid export and home usage. Export was uh, 67.5 over the course of the month with import being 74.2. So this is our average daily house usage and our average daily grid usage over the months. Our average daily house usage was 27, that's the blue line, and our average daily pull from the grid was down at 2.4 uh, 
from 4.8 in June. That's the red line. So that's all positive stuff. In terms of what we sent to the grid, we sent 68 of excess solar generation back to the grid in July. Apart from the 12 um, on the 5th of July that I've already talked about, the remainder was sort of one or two kilowatts, one or two kilowatts each day, which we couldn't use. So a typical scenario is that the battery is fully charged, the hot water is fully heated up, and one of the cars was charging. And this would typically be the Tesla. Um, so towards the end of the, the solar day, once the charger dropped below 1.4, the Zappy would stop charging the car and we would then export for an hour or so until the sun went down. And that's where those little chunks of uh, one, two kilowatts would um, tot up over the course of the month. This chart shows what we pulled from the grid each month. In July, we pulled 75, um, which is half of what we pulled in June, which is good to see. And I've already mentioned the whys and wherefores on that total. So I won't go through that again. Onto the My Energy Eddy, which heats our hot water from surplus solar. The Eddy diverted 43 of solar generation to heat our hot water for the month, 251 for the year, and a running total of 718. I have actually been able to work out the savings for May and June now, um, as although I've not been billed by Octopus Energy, I did extract the reports from the Octopus Watch app now that the data from the meter has actually started to flow through again. And I've used the average cost per kilowatt hour for the month to calculate the savings. It's not 100% accurate, but it's, it's certainly near enough. It's better than the question mark which was there for the last two months. Onto the cars, uh, the Tesla Model 3 covered 1145 miles during the month, bringing its total mileage to 13,258 miles. No issues, um, nothing to report. I mentioned in my June update video that I will be changing the cabin air filter, check, clean and grease the brake calipers uh, when it reaches two years old in September. So I'll certainly do a video on that when I, um, when I do that. Oh, this is from the Tesla Fi uh, website. I've got an account there. And it's a really great feature. It shows all the places we've been in the Tesla. And the darker the blue line, the more times you've actually driven that route. And uh, you can also get a lifetime summary as well. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get the Tesla Fi account right away. It was about three months after I'd picked up the car, so it's not quite accurate. So there's a bit of disparity there in the total mileage shown. The total miles there, the, 200, the watt hours, 273 watt hours per mile, works out at 3.7 kilowatts per mile in old money, for those that are interested. In the Tesla, we did seven supercharging sessions where we added a total of 245.13 for no cost. And that's again, um, I will say this, but it's worth reiterating. It's thanks to those kind individuals who used our Tesla referral code when ordering their cars. They get a thousand three free supercharging miles, as do we. Thank you to those of you who've used it. Hopefully some more of you will use it when you place your order for your Tesla. Home charging on the Tesla added 95.92 and then 72% of our total charge for the month came from sunshine with just 38.31 coming from the grid. The Tesla had three over-the-air software updates during the month and I'm not going to go into the details of what each update contained because there's plenty of videos on YouTube that cover those updates. We're now currently on version 20.0. So 2021.12.25.7. Um, that's, so that's the Tesla. The Kona covered uh, a poultry 354 miles in the month and now has a total mileage of 12,436 miles. It's booked in for its two year service or 20,000 miles, whichever comes first. It's had no software updates, we did no public charging, and there's no issues or problems to report on it. We are actually still waiting to hear when we'll get the battery pack swapped. We've taken actually to parking it down the drive, away from the house and away from the Tesla, just in case it decides to spontaneously combust. I'm, I'm sure it won't, and there's a small minority of them that have, but better safe than sorry, as they say. 
and we actually don't charge it unless it really needs it and we keep that charge level between 20% and below 80% or above 20% and below 80% in the sort of safe zone. So there you go, that's it. Any questions then dive down into the comments and I'll pick them up from there. Usual practice of liking, comment, sharing, subscribing if you haven't already, it's free. And um, as ever, those actions help get this video shown to more people on YouTube, which in turn helps my channel grow. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. All right, take care. Bye.